for a large corporate Roderick. Um, and at and during that time, um, did lots and lots of NHS endo. And I did the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything that could be done right, I've done. And I've also made all the mistakes that people don't, don't talk about. Um, I bought my first practice in 2012. I have a passion for teaching. So I'm also an educational supervisor um, for FDs. We've also got a second practice, and like I said, my passion is uh, my passion is doing and teaching endo. So I did a master's from QMUL, and now I'm an honorary lecturer um, in endodontics. I teach the master's students at the Royal London, um, which is great fun. What am I here for today, and what am I hoping to teach some of you guys? Well, fundamentally, good access is a key to success when it comes to endodontics. You can reduce a lot of errors in process right from the outset if you just have a good understanding of what your access cavity should outline in detail. Um, what are my aims for you today? Okay, um, is just provide a review of normal root canal anatomy, um, provide guidance on access cavity preparation, um, particularly if you're not experienced in doing them routinely. Outline common errors, because if you don't know the mistakes that occur, you won't know how to avoid them. Um, and then discuss the pros and cons of recent changes in endodontic access. You will have all seen um, endo access cavities on Instagram looking the size of keyholes. Um, my question is, are those access keyhole access cavities actually necessary? And if they are, great, we should be doing them. Or is it just for Instagram? Um, normally, it's done out of endodontic boredom where you do so many, it's a game that you play with yourself to see how small an access cavity you can create. Um, and then also, as well as providing guidance on access cavities, you also want to find the canals because the aim of endodontic treatment is to treat apical periodontitis, which involves the removal of bacteria. We can't remove all the bacteria unless we locate all the canals. What do we require from our access cavity? So what are we looking for from our access cavity? What are we trying to achieve? Fundamentally, you want to remove all the caries when present. Okay, I do not understand why people do such small access cavities through large amalgam restorations and large composite restorations. Because you have to always start with why. And I, it's one of my key fundamental teaching principles. Why did that tooth go non-vital? If you can start with why, you can see or well, you can give a better prognosis to the tooth. And if that restoration is leaking and you don't replace it and you've completed the endo, you're not started from a solid foundation. As well as removing all the caries, obviously we are in a, we want to preserve as much quality and quantity of tooth structure as we can, because we know quality and quantity of tooth structure will increase our longevity of our tooth and retention of the tooth long-term. We also want to unroof the pulp chamber completely you should be able to differentiate between the roof of the pulp chamber and the floor of the pulp chamber, okay? Um, remove all the coronal pulp tissue, both vital and necrotic. Locate all the canal orifices with ease, okay? And fundamentally achieve, achieve straight line access to the apical thirds of the canals. This was more with your traditional night eye files. So you have traditional night eye files and you have heat treated night eye files. Um, the heat tree and night side files, files, you also have control me memory wire, which are more flexible and more wear resistant. And so the last point, I would say you may need to learn how to use those more advanced toys to be able to carry that out more predictably. This is how I was taught endo. Uh, fundamentally, I was taught endo. Um, I was taught endo as in these are your access cavity designs. Okay, this is where you draw a triangle from the front teeth, rhomboids for the back teeth, and circles for the ones in the middle. But we know that actually it shouldn't be us that guides our access cavity. It should be the tooth itself, its shape, and it's where you predict the pulp chamber to be. So although I was taught this, I no longer would give you just draw a circle, draw all, draw a oval, draw a triangle, draw a rhomboid. I'll try and teach you something a little bit more sophisticated that's still easy to understand. Location, 
well, if we know what we're looking for, then you know where it's likely to be. So uh, having an understanding of your anatomy is very, very important. These are just uh, images to show you that root canals are just not a cone-shaped um, object that tapers to the bottom. They have complex anatomy where you can get apical fins, apical deltas, lateral canals, accessory anatomy, um, even fercation canals. And alongside that, you can also need to make sure, like I said, you remove the coronal pulp tissue. Tools of the trade, how can you make your life a lot, lot easier? Fundamentally, magnification and light. Guys, I don't believe you can genuinely do endo successfully without some sort of magnification. Now, that may be loops, okay? or well, that might be a microscope, but no magnification would be challenging, okay? I'd encourage all of you in the early stages of your career, if you can, consider getting yourself a decent pair of loops, okay? It'll be a game changer. What do I use? I use a combination of both loops and my microscope. I'm not a purist. I will not sit here and turn around and say, endo can only be done with a microscope. Um, I fundamentally believe that so long as you can see what you're treating in a predictable fashion with magnification, do what you feel more comfortable with. Um, also light, the type of mirror that you can have can also affect the outcome. Front facing mirrors are a lot better at reflecting light. Um, the better the mirror you have, okay, the more you can see. I use relax mirrors, okay, um, which are great at providing a crystal clear image. So sometimes the tools that you have do help you. Also, I'm sure all of you would have heard of the endo Z burr, okay? It's a non-end cutting tip burr, which allows you to safely enlarge in your axis if you wish to, without um, worrying about going through the floor of the pulp chamber. I know one of the anxieties I had at the beginning of the beginning of my career was, please don't perforate, please don't perforate, please don't perforate. Um, and I'm here to change your story and make sure you're able to access with confidence and in a predictable fashion. Also, these burrs in the middle are LM or gooseneck burrs. They're great at troughing for canals. So when you're looking for canals, especially deep within the tooth, these can help with your visualization. And furthermore, they're a little bit safer than using a drill because you're cutting and drilling more precisely. For me, I use an endo ultrasonic unit. That is my unit that I use, the Neutron P5. It's just a more precise and clear cut. And if you have the benefit of using endo ultrasonic tips, they're great at refining your access cavity preparation and locating canals. Probes and orifice openers. You all would have hopefully seen one of these probes. It's called a DG16 probe. Um, it will, it's basically a sharp ended probe that is amazing at locating canals. You can also get some probes that have the equivalent of a hand file attached to them. I honestly don't use them very often. Those are really difficult to access cases where they come in useful, but mainly it's the DG16 probe. And then orifice openers, I am more towards being inclined to preserve as much peri-cervical dentine as I can. So I don't commonly use orifice openers, but if you would, most of you at uni would have used um, or would be aware of Gates Glidden Burrs, and we also have DG, or as well as the Gate Foon Burrs, you also have the SX Burr. The SX Burr is from Dense Slice Rona. It's the uh, orifice opener. It's the one that's routinely used by quite a few endodontists. It's nice, but like I said, I think we're moving away now from doing large tapered preparations to more conservative preparations and enhancing our irrigation at the same time. So do I use orifice openers? Unless it's really complex anatomy, like an S-shaped canal, very rarely. Also, you can only find what you can see, and if you're struggling to see, then using canal detector dye, which is just basically methylene blue, um, can help assist you in the process. Uh, assist, help assist you in the process. Access strategy. A common question that's always asked: Do you remove the restorational crown before you start? For me. Okay, if there's any question marks around the quality of the restoration, and unless it was recently placed, 
or placed by myself, I'm more inclined to take the restoration out because many people commonly think an amalgam that looks like that is okay to access through. Well, it's ditched. It looks like it's fractured in a few areas and it's got peripheral rim fractures escalating from it. And if you don't remove that, you don't know what's underneath. And if there's a vertical crack running through that, you wouldn't have even seen it and done an endo and wouldn't have understood why that tooth is still symptomatic. You can only treat what you can see. So I would always advise if you're not sure or not confident about the quality of the restoration that's placed, remove it to begin with and carry out a pre-endo buildup. Benefits, there's numerous, okay? Helps you, um, helps you find or locate hidden caries or fractures that you couldn't see otherwise. It also enables you to better assess the restorability of the tooth. In the early stages of my career, I'm, I know the one thing I found most challenging was making that decision as to whether a tooth is restorable or not. One of the key principles I have is always is the quality and quantity of tooth structure, the remaining tooth structure that will govern the long-term success of the tooth. The more tooth structure you have, the more likely your restoration will last for a longer period of time because you'll be able to bond to that tooth structure. Also, easier to use Apex locator. Well, quite surely, especially if it's especially if you've got a crown on the tooth or an amalgam restoration, you're not going to get the apex locator beeping out. Um, so yes, prevent restorative debris being dislodged or unintentionally pushed into the root canal system. I've never done this, guys, okay? Um, but in theory, if you're not very precise in what you're doing, okay, debris can be pushed into the root canal system and start to block the canals, which is what you don't want to do. Okay, improved post-operative seal. Of course, guys, if you take out the restoration and do a pre-endo buildup, you've got a better seal, especially if you're doing two-stage um, two endo. Or if you're not even doing two-stage endo, you've got a better final restoration at the end and you've done the difficult part at the beginning. So I always do pre-endo buildups. Reduce chances of missed canals and perforations. You can only treat what you can see. And we'd all agree that removing the restoration enhances your visualization, which means you're more likely not to perforate or more likely to cause less procedural errors than you normally would. And yes, open preparations will always make it easier to locate canals. And taking that restoration out in this scenario hasn't compromised the tooth at all because you've only removed a restoration and it allows you to do and see and plan what you're gonna do next. And fact, clinicians are 40% more likely to miss fractures, caries and marginal breakdown if restorations were not completely removed. Four out of 10 is quite a lot, or it's a lot for me anyway. So let's go, go through the access strategy, okay? Always estimate the position of the pulp chamber, okay? Most of you will have the benefit of digital x-rays. Okay, in the early stages of your careers, I'd want you to take your coronal reference point and set that as a standard. Know where the roof of your pulp chamber is, know where the floor of your pulp chamber is, and know where the circation is. Why are these points or marks very important to label out? You'll know how far you can drill with comfort and ease, okay? And basically, you never want to go deeper than the floor of the pulp chamber because you'll make your locating canals more challenging and more difficult. And the closer the roof and the floor of the pulp chamber are with regards to depth, the more challenging the endo. And if there's calcifications in there, even more difficult. Okay. Uh, Fication, honest truth, I no longer take a fication measurement, but it will help reduce your anxiety to know how deep you can drill before you reach that point. But you should never go that far because you never want to go beneath the floor of the pulp chamber. So most pulp chambers will be located between five to seven millimeters on posterior teeth. You can also, to help guide your access cavity preparation, this tooth, for example, has distal caries. You can mark on where the depth of the caries is. Once you've carried out the caries removal, you can translate your preparation across, especially, especially if you're doing 
carries um, directed access, okay, where you can sometimes remove the carries and use that, only remove what is necessary and try and preserve as much to structure as you possibly can. Here, we know that where the carries is, is roughly extending towards the floor of the pulp chamber. So I'd remove the carries and extend across. If you don't have the benefit of digital x-rays and traditional x-rays, obviously you'd have to take the 5% magnification of analog x-rays into consideration, but this only provides you with an estimate. And I'd say it's the least accurate way of doing it. We now live in the world of CBCT scans, which are amazing, but we don't scan every single patient, okay? Um, scans are gonna help us with complex cases, particularly retreats or any suspect complex anatomy. Um, it's like performing guided surgery and I think is the way of the future and most machines are getting their x-ray dose down. So plan the process, okay? Before you pick up a drill, you should know how far you're going and where you suspect the canals to be. What am I looking for also on my x-rays? Okay, the degree of chamber calcification, the more chamber calcification, the more difficult the endo. Number of roots and suspected canals that that tooth is expected to have, and the approximate canal length. So always look at calcifications, number of canals, approximate length of the canal taken off your digital x-ray. And also we know the more curved a canal, the more challenging its preparation. So I would also look at the shape of the canals that I'm preparing. Then traditionally, you'd line up for the largest orifice, okay? In molars, penetration angles should always be towards the largest canal because the pulp chamber space is usually the largest just above that canal. So for upper, teeth, the largest canal is obviously the palatal, so we'd attempt to locate the palatal first. In lower molars, it's your distal, you try and locate the distal first and then extend your axis cavity across. Be aware of challenging cases, teeth that are crowns or are bridge abutments, the orientation isn't necessarily correct, so plan the process. And in rotated and tilted teeth, okay, remember, you know which direction straight is in, okay? And sometimes when patients have severely tilted or rotated teeth, I very rarely access without rubber dam on, but if there's a scenario where a tooth is severely tilted or rotated, I'll drill myself a little guide hole within the tooth to tell me which direction I should be going in, and I'll mark the buccal surface of the tooth in the direction in which the root's going, okay? So that's the long axis of the tooth that will always help orientate me in the right direction. And that will come off with an ultrasonic scaler. Don't worry, I don't mark people's teeth forever. Penetrate the pulp chamber. I was traditionally taught, feel for a drop. But what if the pulp chamber is calcified? You might carry on feeling for a drop all the time, okay? So maybe not a great idea or a great technique with or without rubber dam. Like I said, I traditionally try and do it as much as I can with rubber dam on, but in really challenging cases where teeth are lingually inclined, rotated, um, I may decide to do a little guide hole to direct me before I actually penetrate the pulp chamber. But traditionally, always, always, always with rubber dam, okay? Spurs, honestly, I don't mind what anyone uses. It's whatever's most comfortable in your hands. But what I would turn around and say, is always know the length and the width of the burr that you're using. Because if you know its length, you know how far you're drilling within the tooth in relation to your reference point and the width, you know how far across you're going. You're planning your process, you're winning. So yeah, anyone. Then how do you refine your prep? Quite simply, endo Z burrs, okay, are amazing or any safe ended or non-end, uh, cutting burrs are great. The one that we traditionally use is the Endo Z burr, um, which is great. It comes in nine and 11 millimeter shanks. I'd always just get the 11 millimeter shank for the simple fact that the longer it is, the more you can see. So I don't know why you'd go for a shorter one. And then know where you're aiming for and what you're looking for, okay? For anterior teeth, center of the tooth, 
okay, is where you'll make your initial point of entry. But remember, then you need to redirect your axis cavity to follow the long axis of the tooth and how it is set in the jaw. Remember, your upper anterior teeth are set slightly proclined in the maxilla. So you can't just carry on drilling for the center of the tooth because you'll go too far buckly. You need to then reangulate your axis. But point of entry is the center of the tooth. How do I do it? I literally X marks the spot, okay, and I see the center. Once I've found the center, I'll draw my initial point of entry and then follow the long axis of the tooth in. Fundamentally, your axis cavities when moving from incisors to canines generally will go from a more triangular to oval shape. The more further around the arch you go. Why? Because remember your anterior teeth or your upper incisors in particular have quite prominent pulp horns and your axis cavity should remove all of the coronal pulp tissue, both necrotic and vital. Why? Because we want to reduce the incidences of the tooth going non-vital. Oh, sorry. Reduce the incidences of relieving pulpal remnants there and then causing discoloration in the long term. So you can be more conservative the more, the more you move from an incisor to a canine. But remember that you need to remove all of the coronal pulp tissue and eliminate the pulp horns. In older individuals, obviously, the axis cavity wouldn't be as prominent as what is shown for the upper incisor, it would be smaller because the pulp chamber would have calcified with time. Lower incisors get a special mention because 40% of lower incisors have a second canal, which is usually located slightly lingual to the main canal. So you may have to extend your axis cavity slightly lingual um, if you suspect a second canal. Um, I would always check for, an, for a second canal um, because the incidence rate is quite high. Upper premolars and lower premolars. Upper premolar, point of entry is quite easy. It's the central groove between the cusp tips. And if you're then looking for a second canal, you'd extend your axis cavity across towards the buccal and lingual, okay? The direction in which the file goes will give you a lot of information. If it's located dead center within the tooth, there may only be one um, canal present, but if the file's bending towards the buccal, then there's likely to also be a second palatal canal. So let the tooth and the anatomy provide you with the necessary information for you to successfully locate all the canals. Lower premolars, no one ever taught me this. I don't know why, um, until I did my masters. The crowns of mandibular premolars are slightly tilted lingually relative to their roots. And so we need to adjust our starting location for our axis cavities to compensate for this tilt. Because the crowns are tilted slightly lingually, we move our axis cavity or our initial point of entry slightly more towards the buccal cusp, okay? Those are your premolars done. Upper premolars, I would always suspect or predict that there's two canals and eliminate for one. I would never just assume there is one canal. I'd always check for a second. And in oval shaped canals, always be careful to make sure you use a pre-bended hand file to explore the oval orifice with an apically curved small instrument to ensure that the canal is not splitting further down. So it's not a one-two configuration. Okay, that can happen on occasions as well. And they're challenging to prepare, but you can do it. Molars, upper molars in particular, the one that stresses everyone out. Um, I always send around and say to everyone, like, I don't like to make your access cavity designs or planning very difficult. I don't give you a precise formula, like no, two millimeters from the central fossa or anything like that. I like you to try and visualize the tooth and break it down into stages as to what you're doing. So for me, 
for my molar strategies, I have a mesial line boundary and a distal line boundary. And the mesial line boundary is the line connecting the mesial cusp tips. And we know that pulp chambers are rarely found mesial to this imaginary line. And then the distal boundary is the oblique ridge. Okay, the number of times I see people are extending their axis cavities more so towards the distal is so unnecessary because pulp chambers are rarely found there, guys. And then when you once you've got your mesial line boundary and you've got your distal line boundary, the point of entry is just the central groove halfway between them. And I literally get my perio probe or DG16 probe, mark out these boundaries, aim for the center in between look for the palatal first and then extend across to look for my mesial MBs, mesial buckle MB1, MB2, and DB canals. I hope that makes sense. If it was a practical, I could definitely show you so easily. Another common mistake that's made is we don't fully de roof the pulp chamber, so make sure you do. How can you do that? You can use either an ultrasonic unit or a safe ended verb, but if you don't even have those, use a large rose, rose head on the outward stroke and you'll de roost the pulp chamber. Lower molars, again, I will give you a mesial line boundary and a distal line boundary. The good thing is the mesial boundary is exactly the same. Line connecting the mesial cusp tips. Pulp chambers are really found mesial to this imaginary line. So now you already know what you're kind of aiming at. The distal boundary is obviously the line connecting the buccal and lingual grooves. And again, the point of entry is the central groove halfway between both these boundaries. So your axis strategies for your upper and lower, apart from the line boundaries being a little bit different, are fairly similar, guys. Also, remember that quite often, lower molars do also have two distal canals. Again, always assume there's two, okay? and then be happy if there's only one. Golden rule, if I put you to sleep this afternoon or this evening, okay, just remember this one rule, okay, which is it should be the walls of the root canal rather than the walls of your access preparation that guide the passage of instruments into the canal, okay? And I always get asked, like I said, I'm, I don't use orifice openings very often, but some that do, they always ask me, Gates Glidens, which is the largest size that I can use, okay? It's the largest that can be placed passively two millimeters apical to the orifice. So it should be a passive insertion of the gates into the canal, not forcing it in. And I would avoid using large gates, like Gates Glidens, fours, fives, and sixes, particularly in MB canals of upper molars and lower molars. Why? Because commonly there is a concavity that's found on the distal aspect of the mesial root, and you can sometimes cause a strip perforation. And I'm sure your clinical demonstrators or lecturers have talked to, to you about this. Gates, use a smaller size. SX, those are great at doing this as well. Or Use more flexible heat-treated nitrite or control memory wire instruments that are more flexible and you don't have to get rid of valuable peri-cervical dentine. Common errors in the anterior dentition. We talked about this one earlier where pole pawns are not cleared and you can get discoloration of the tooth. Second common one is that you carry on going buckly, especially if the canal sclerosed, there is a tendency for you to carry on going buckly without redirecting yourself. And sometimes you can cause a perforation and it's not very pleasant. So plan the process. Okay, remember initial point of entry and then redirect to the long axis of the tooth. If you don't do the redirections, you cause undue stress on the file, undue stress on the file, with incorrect access, uh, access cavity preparation can cause file breakages. Not taking your measurements, okay, not planning the process, not knowing where the roof and floor is, okay, um, can lead to perforations or perforations into the fecation space, makes your treatment more unpredictable. 
and not taking into consideration the tilts and angulations, particularly of teeth that are crowns, okay? Even with teeth with crowns, guys, you have to ask yourself, why is that tooth gone non-vital? And how large is the infection on it? Because if there's a poor quality or ill-fitting crown on there, why are you doing endo through the crown? Take the crown off, assess the restorability of the tooth, and then subsequently decide whether you can do an endo and new crown. Because if you don't know what is hidden, you won't know how to treat it. Are there areas incorrect access um, cavity locations? So not obeying where the line boundaries are, missing canals, okay? Or I know I said take restorations out and you don't have to go ninja, but at the same time, you should be mindful of any two structure you're over to structure you are removing and you do not want to at any time remove valuable to structure unnecessarily okay others is materials being dislodged into the root canal space causing blockages e is a very common error where people think they're at the floor of the pulp chamber whereas really they're only at the roof which means you've left all that necrotic material in between so be aware of that. Here is just an example of a referral case to mine. I'm not here to show you how amazing I am, but this is an endo that was referred to me. Incorrect, obviously, or incorrect access where they were going off. Fortunately, they stopped just about in time and referred to me. And we were able to then relocate the canals more centrally following the access cavity guidelines that I gave you and correctly directing that into the right location. Fortunately, that didn't actually perforate on the mesial aspect of the tooth. So although compromised, is not completely unrestorable. Here's another one. People are quite keen to commonly do endo access cavities through crowns because they thought all oh, the crowns are okay. But remember, the crown completely changes the orientation of the tooth. And here, again, another dentist nearly perforate through the side of the tooth um, whilst doing endo access through the crown. Stopped because they couldn't find any of the canals. Referred to me. The easiest thing is take the crown off so you can see what you're dealing with. And then subsequently, endo completed and then a composite core buildup. And I did the rest over here because the other dentist didn't feel comfortable and wanted me to complete. I am a strong advocate of biometric dentistry, so I don't really practice crowns. Could you imagine what would have been left of that tooth if we carried out a crown preparation? You'd hardly have any coronal tooth structure. Here, we're trying to preserve as much as we can and, and get as good a seal as we possibly can. Predictable dentistry. Second part, let's run through this and we can have a chat about it, okay? Um, root canal location, obviously our main objective and what we all want is to locate all the canals, but you'll only find what you know. So the key is to know where and where the canals are and how many canals that tooth is expected to have. What can help us? A knowledge of anatomy, our radiographs, actually spending time evaluating our radiographs, the toys that we have, and our access cavity designs. If we can carry out appropriate access cavity designs, we're winning. Just to show you, if you thought endo was easy, root canal anatomies are complex. Okay, Vitucci et al, 1984, classified eight, or at least eight types of eight different types of canal configurations, all showing complex anatomies and shapes that can be difficult to prepare. But having a knowledge of these shapes can sometimes give you information of what your preparation is doing and what you're feeling within a root canal space. Uh, Glove Vela itself also showed in a Mongolese population that there's a further seven classifications. And these are only ideas of the shapes that you have. So you don't need to memorize these off by heart but you should know how complex the root canal morphology actually is and what shapes you can sometimes expect. Radiographs, 
what's important to look for. Like I said, always have an understanding of the number of routes that the 2000, the expected number of root canals, any unusual root morphologies. What do I mean by that? Is it too severely curved? Um, is the root severely curved? Is the tooth tilted? Is it angulated? What's going on with the root itself? Has it got an extreme, or has it got a, has it got a curvature along its entire length, or is there acute apical curvature? Um, furthermore, the PDL space, okay, because we're obviously treating apical pathosis, okay, or apical periodontitis, so you also have to evaluate the periodontal ligament space around the tooth. I'd also add to that, I do look for calcifications, curvatures, and root canal length, because I am just treatment planning in my head how easy or how difficult this endo is going to be and predicting what challenges I'm likely to face. So for example, on that upper left six, just looking at it, I would turn around and say, well, distance between the roof and the floor of the pulp chamber is fairly narrow, possibly a slightly prominent mesiobuccal pulp horn, the root canals themselves, okay, look moderate to long in length. They're not short um, root canals, okay? And my estimated length will most probably on this one be anything between 22 to 24 four millimeters. And then look at curvatures. Is there any curvatures? Well, on that MB route, there is a slight curvature, or I'd say a moderate curvature on the root. And also, I would say, there's a curvature along the entire length of that root canal or entire length of that canal. Um, so I would predict that due to that curvature, that canal is likely to be a little bit more challenging and then looking for calcifications. Well, I can't see the canals fully from top to bottom in all of those canals. So I'd suspect that there are some calcifications there, which means preparation time might be slightly longer. Radiographs can also help you locate extra canals, okay? Um, if you get a sudden narrowing or disappearing of the pulp space, there may be canal division where one canal splits into two, okay? Or if you get two PDL, periodontal ligament spaces, okay? It may suggest that there may be an extra root. Is there an unusual contour of the tooth? Does it just look odd? If it looks odd, there may be something go going on, okay? An extra dark line in the coronal third of the root canal adjacent to a di diagnostic file may mean an extra canal. So if you're taking a working lens radiograph and you see an extra dark line adjacent to where you've got your um, diagnostic file, then suspect that there may be another canal, okay? Here's an example of it. Okay, thin radiolucent shadow along the obturary root canal space. May mean that there is a missed canal there. There was in that case. I think the pre-op x-ray or post-op x-ray has been missed off. Role of the endodontic explorer. I love this, okay. I don't think you can even do it with just a sharp probe. And DG16 probe is amazing at just opening up the coronal aspect of canals and actually locating them. You need to be able to see what you're doing, but as well as being able to see what you're doing, you must be able to feel and get some tactile feedback from the tooth. And these to significantly make your life so much easier in locating canals. So if you haven't ever got one of these or used one of these, use them. Okay, they're a very simple and affordable tool to use while locating your canals. Now, if there was one paper that everyone asks, if there's one paper that I could teach any undergrad or postgrad when it comes to endo, okay, it would most probably be this, which is Krasner and from 2004. It's the laws of orifice location. And the laws of orifice location can help guide you to find where your suspected canals are. And it reduces some of your anxiety if you have knowledge of where and what you're looking for. They presented us with quite a few laws, okay, which help to guide our preparation and guide where we suspect canals to be. 
okay? Law of centrality of the CEJ, okay? So what we'd do is we'd locate where the CEJ is on the external surface of the tooth, okay? And we know that the pulp chamber is always at the center of the tooth at the level of the CEJ. So if we know where the CEJ is, we know the pulp chamber is always located at the center of the tooth at that side. And all of, um, so we know that it's always located in the center of the tooth. Then there's the law of concentricity, where the pulp chamber walls are concentric to the external surface of the tooth, which basically means the pulp chamber mimics the external shape of the tooth. So what the external shape of the tooth looks like is what the pulp chamber will mimic. And if I know that, it helps guide my preparation. And then finally, the law, or finally on this slide, the distance from the external surface of the tooth to the walls of the pulp chamber is the same circumferentially at the level of the CJ. So if I found the distal canal to be three millimeters from the external surface of the tooth at the CJ, then likely it is the other canals are going to be a similar distance. So we can start to plan our process. And if we're struggling to find canals, these laws can really, really, really help. Law of symmetries, or the law of symmetry applies for everything but upper molars, okay? Fundamentally, okay, the orifices of canals are always located equidistant from a line drawn in a mesial distal direction through the floor of the pole chamber. Now let's talk practically, how is this done? You literally just get a sharp probe, put it across the center of the tooth and see if the canals are located dead center. If they're not located on that line, they're equidistant to it. So say if you found the MB in this case, okay, you know if the MB was a millimeter and a half away from the center of the tooth, because you put a probe down the mesial distal direction of the tooth, you know that the DB or ML in this case would be located one and a half millimeters across. So it's guiding you as to where to look for your canals. Furthermore, as well as being equidistant, the orifices are always perpendicular to a line drawn in a mesial distal direction across the center of the tooth. So it's not going to be off to one side. You, it will be equidistant and perpendicular. So we know where to look because we're just extending our preparation across. We're not extending it into the mesial aspect of the tooth a little bit more or towards the center of the tooth because it will more than likely be equidistant and perpendicular, okay? And if they are not located in the center of the tooth, then you should suspect that there may be a second distal canal, for example, on a lower molar. Here's a prime example, okay? We wanna make sure that we look for the second canal, okay? Um, and here, I'm sorry, I think on this slide, someone's actually, or when we formatted it, it's moved across, but that red line should be in the middle of the tooth, I can't actually draw on the line, but we extend across to find it. And similarly, that red line should be placed a little bit more dead center. Okay, I think in this format, it's reformatted it slightly. Laws of color change as well. We know that the color of the pulp chamber floor is always darker than its walls. It's always darker. So if we know it's darker, this will help you differentiate guys between the roof of the pulp chamber and the floor of the pulp chamber but always take the measurements at the start as well. So look for color change, okay? If you're drilling white, you're not drilling near the floor of the pulp chamber, okay? Whites or yellows means you may have extended your prep in the wrong direction, okay? Or you're still too superficial, which you can recheck with your pre-op x-ray, okay? And if we don't destroy the floor, the benefits of not drilling beyond the floor of the pulp chamber, okay? We know that the orifices of the root canals are always located at the junctions where the floor meets the wall, okay? So it can, again, help guide us. If you can know that the floor is a different color and then you know the whites of the walls, you'll find them at the junctions. And they'll always be found at the angles of the floor wall junction, not up the wall or down the wall. If you know where the wall is, it'll be found at the angle. Okay, 
And then finally, the roadmap, okay? The orifices of root canals are always located at the terminus or ends of the root developmental lines. Some people call it the roadmap, okay? It is the roadmap. If you, are, if you don't destroy the floor of the pulp chamber, it can help guide you sometimes, or you can find these developmental lines which will show you where other orifices may or may not be. Proper access and canal location is only complete when the entire pulp chamber floor is visible without any overlying obstructions. Now, these are not my access cavity preparations. This is just taken from a textbook. I would say the incisors and premolars, generally speaking, are actually absolutely fine. I'd say particularly the molars, a couple of them are most probably not conservative enough. Okay, I think they've taken away too much valuable um, to structure there, and you could have been a little bit more a little bit more conservative. I'd say in the early stages of your career, reduce your anxiety. You do not need to do ninja or keyhole surgery when it comes to endo. Okay, but at the same time, be mindful of what you're drilling and try and preserve what we can. Here's a few cases. Okay, of orifice directed or denting con conservation access. It's got many names, okay? Punch hole access, truss access, ninja access, conservative access, okay? But fundamentally, the idea is you try and preserve as much pericervical dentine as is humanely possible, okay? Um, and as you can see, that is as minimally invasive as minimally invasive gets, okay? Again, these are taken from textbooks, not mine. Mine's there's plenty of examples on Instagram, okay? Minimally invasive endo, okay? Actually, this is just to describe to you between traditional and conservative and ultra-conservative ninja access. Polatino et al, uh, or Platino et al, found that actually the fracture resistance of a tooth between a conservative or an ultra-conservative ninja access cavity was nearly exactly the same because we know through finite elemental analysis studies that forces on a tooth concentrate around its narrowest point and the narrowest point of the tooth is around the neck so with ninja cav ninja access cavities you're preserving more tooth structure coronally but around the neck of the tooth between conservative and ultra conservative um, access cavities you have a similar amount of dentine unlike your traditional access cavities where you've not been mindful of the two structure you're removing. So I would say most of Dirac's access cavities are conservative access cavities. And on occasions just through boredom, okay, I may do an ultra conservative access cavity. But is it necessary? Well, I think it makes your endo more challenging and may make it more unpredictable. And if it's not going to give me any benefit when it comes to fracture resistance of the tooth, then I may decide against it, okay? Um, truss accesses, there's no formal definition at the moment, but again, it's just like doing two mini access cavities, one for the distal canal and one separate one for the mesial canals, for both upper and lower. And the idea is of dentine pr preservation and leaving a truss of dentine between the two cavities. I'd say here, you definitely, if you were doing these sorts of access cavities, have to be using enhanced irrigation techniques. Put simply, if you're preserving that much dentine, you also need to make sure you're removing the bacteria that's flooded that tooth and caused you the initial problems. My opinion and my overview, plan your treatment, okay? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, okay? Um, and this is through a thorough preoperative assessment, okay? Remove the existing restorations and caries, just makes your planning a lot more easier, makes the process a little bit easier, and makes your end outcome a little bit more predictable. And let that guide your access cavity preparation because you're not losing any further tooth structure, okay? Be as conservative as possible as long as it doesn't compromise your vision and cleaning, okay? So you have to think about endo resto, okay? You don't want to make your 
be so conservative that you, you're not effectively cleaning the root canal system, but at the same time, be so destructive that you're leaving nothing of the tooth behind. So that comes with time and experience. And I think your confidence will come through knowledge, okay? Fundamentally, just learn more about endo, okay? Obviously, we run quite a few endo courses, okay? And resto courses. But for you guys, I'm doing the three-day seminar, so I look forward to joining you guys next week. And any questions you have or anything you're unsure about, because I'm sure you guys might, or some of you guys will have exams coming up, feel free to send me a message on Instagram if you have any questions that you're unsure about. Or I'm happy to stay behind today, answer a few questions that you may have.